Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started here. We'll carry over from yesterday. So, okay, so, uh, so now let's talk about Little League Shoulder. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how many of you have Little League kids right now, but uh, uh, in my days in Little League, I, I think it's true that there's more fights among the parents than there were among the kids. So uh, this, is, uh, this is actually from a, the classic article about Little League Shoulder uh, back in AJSM in 1998. Uh, let see. Jonah, what do you think of this case? Absolutely. So we've got a couple of radiographs of a uh, skeletally immature patient's um, shoulder. Um, now the image on the uh, viewer's far left, we see some widening of that uh, growth plate, some osseous fragments, stuff like that. Um, and we do see some widening um, of that side relative to, I guess, the comparison uh, more normal side. Yeah, this is the asymptomatic side. This is the symptomatic side. So what do you think is going on here? Well, I think we have a growth plate injury, and uh, classically, uh, this would uh, be described as a little of your shoulder in the appropriate clinical setting. Um, but of course, we see the widening, we see the irregularity, uh, especially on the metaphyseal side, and this is a growth plate injury, uh, and uh, this is very classic, especially starting on the lateral side like this. This is really classic for overuse, which is what. Uh, Little League Shoulder is. So this is Little League Shoulder. Uh, <coughs> uh, Jeff, this is an MR study on a, another patient from Colorado. What do you think of this case? A 16-year-old patient with shoulder pain. Uh, so we have the uh, coronal PD fat side image and a T2 fat side image is demonstrating. Uh, at the physis, we have a uh, uh, significant increase in signal intensity uh, as well as uh, uh, widening of the physis as well, some irregularity. Uh, and uh, so this is also kind of consistent with um, an injury, a physical injury, uh, as we demonstrated in the previous radi radiograph. Yeah, and here's what it looks like. This is a more subtle case on MR examination, and this this is a patient with a uh, little league shoulder. Yes. I, w I want to ask Jeff uh, a question from. What... Yes. Uh, can you put up uh, the last image? Uh, what's the weakest link of the physis? What, what, what does uh, uh, layer? Uh, Area of calcification. Oh, right. The uh, provisional calcification. For you guys, it's not that terribly important, but Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. So I had a question on this case. When, so when you have that much signal intensity within the physis, um, how, can you exclude the, the Salter-Harris type 1 fracture? Well, that's essentially what this is, except it's not acute. And you can exclude it by the fact the patient didn't have an acute injury. It's the history that makes a difference. But this really is a, an injury along the, the, the plate. It's not a crush injury, so this really is a kind of a chronic type of Salter 1 injury. So it's a repetitive trauma type of problem. Right, right. Now, one thing you have to do, you have to look at some normals uh, because there's normally high signal intensity along the physis. This is a little bit more edema than we typically see in the metaphysis here. This is more than normal, uh, but it's important to see that. And if you're out of practice and you don't see very many of these, uh, if there's a real concern, you might want to just do one image to the other side, the PD fat set, just to check and make sure that they're, that it's not physiologic if you don't see a lot of this. This is more than physiologic. You shouldn't have this irregularity going into the epiphysis like this. Uh, but I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So this is a little league shoulder. Uh, we got a 15-year-old male again with right shoulder pain, throwing pain for the past two months. Uh, we've got a front, two frontal views of the shoulder with natural position and abduction. Uh, again, it looks like the um, 
along the uh, metaphysis, or actually the suffice pillar is like a little widening and irregular, but along the lateral aspect, uh, it's just more lucency of the metaphysis. Um, again, uh, this is the MRI, multiple uh, chronos and a sagittal axial views with pity, fat, sad, and it looks again. Most of the disease is typically on the metaphyseal side of these injuries. Uh, but this is again, uh, a soldier one, you would just have separation with, within the growth plate and you wouldn't see all these chronic changes that look like erosive disease. So in a case I used the mic, John. In a case like this, this is clearly uh, a, a long-standing disease because you've got all this injury to the, to the metaphyseal uh, side of the growth plate and uh, hypertrophic changes in some hibernation here. And these are typical of chronic erosive changes that we see in other erosive disease, uh, which lets us know that there's chronic injury in this particular case. So this is clearly different from if it were an acute Salter 1 type injury, where you just uh, edema. Uh, uh, would you say a little uh, slip here? I'm sorry, what, John? A little lateral slip of the yeah. metaphysis. Yeah, I think the metaphysis is a little bit laterally slipped with respect to the epiphysis. Or a little medial rotation of the uh, the epiphysis here. So uh, I agree with you. Uh, so there is a little bit of slippage in this case, uh, but but still the the primary etiology here is chronic repetitive trauma, as John said, yeah. not an acute injury. Uh, one thing for sure, I would never let this get through again. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So uh, yeah. you will. Yeah. <laughs> so we have lily shoulders. Which Chronic repetitive stress. Uh, uh, here is uh, here's a patient. This is on 20. Let's see, January 13th, 2012, uh, and then uh, this is now uh, two months later, two and a half months later, and you can see that there's already beginning a lot of healing response here. One of the problems when you have entries to the growth plates like this that we know from other areas is sometimes you can get bony bridging of the growth plate and then you can get uh, growth disturbances uh, because it doesn't grow normally. Uh, and I think we can see some bony bridging uh, in this particular case. So there are a lot of different names for it. Uh, and uh, you can get and then we just saw went through the radiographic findings. Treatment, relative rest from throwing for an average of three months using isonal analgesia. Uh, as I'll, I think I'll talk about in a minute, uh, Olympus Fasti at Curlin Job and I tried to do a study a number of years ago uh, of uh, little league shoulders, and I think I'll show you that in a minute. So let me come back to that. This is just some other examples from Korea of little league shoulder. They all look very similar. This uh, widening, it primarily starts laterally, and then you can start seeing these erosive changes extend medially over time. Uh, okay. Fourteen-year-old picture with shoulder pain. So, coronal T1 and PD fat saturated images of the shoulder, and there's a uh, irregularity at the lateral uh, margin of the physis with. Uh, high signal on the PD image. There's also edema within the um, epiphysis of the bone. And there's uh, more uh, subconjular, or I, I suppose irregularity along the physis with the erosions. So similar, and then sagittal T1, so similar findings from the little league shoulder. Well, we did a study where we took little league players who had shoulder pain, and we did a full MR of the symptomatic side and, uh, well, we did actually MRs of both shoulders, both the symptomatic and asymptomatic side. And then uh, to, comp to compare the two, uh, and we found that clearly in those patients who had symptomatic shoulders, we always saw changes, well, in the group that we were looking at where we were concerned about little league shoulder, uh, the symptomatic throwing side always had a thickened uh, growth plate that had increased uh, fluid within it. And the amount of, of erosive change on the metaphysis correlated pretty well with their symptoms. The more erosive changes, the more the symptoms they had, and the more chronic the symptoms were. Uh, and then we compared them with the other side, and we essentially never found these erosive changes in the non-throwing shoulder. So these really are spe specific for chronic repetitive trauma and throwing. Uh, 
And that our, what our study was supposed to do was then take them out of throwing activity for three months. And then we were going to re-image the shoulder to see what, see what happened over time. And it turned out that about 90% of those players, uh, what we asked them to do was not throw during that three months uh, to, to allow it to heal so we could see what the healing response looked like over time. And 90% of the kids said no. If they were going to do that, they would change doctors. So they refused to not throw. So I, John said the correct thing would be to have these people stop throwing. But in, at least in, in our experience, uh, they, will, they will voluntarily cut back but we could not get them to stop throwing. So, uh, and uh, some of the times it was their parents that came in and were most angry. So we had to uh, stop the study. John? In my experience, the parents are the, the real problem, not the kids. Um, and um, like in, in, at, at uh, one of our high schools out here, and I guess I better not name it, um, but I was a team doctor there, and uh, and the parents uh, the, the, the were so uh, so upsetting that the coaches uh, only would last one season. Uh, the coaches couldn't take it on a daily basis because their uh, little uh, Johnny had to pitch, or, or, or they're going to throw the coach out. And so the, after a while, the coaches were. Uh, I would leave well, because they they were not paid for to do this. Our coaches don't get paid in high school. Uh, they use uh, you know they they do it uh, on their own time and then and they're hoping to go uh, to junior college and then uh, to the pros and whatever. And uh, I, I'm afraid that uh, uh, the place where I, I was a doctor, uh, uh, the coaches never got to do that because they only lasted a year. Wow. So, where the parents uh, in in most um, sports that I have been involved in, uh, including football, uh, for the most part, uh, the parents have always been a problem. Uh, so, uh, and and the post, uh, the parents really need to to, to, to give a spanking. <laughs> if if it's so bad that a kid will not listen to you. Uh, then you have to put them in a cast or something, and and there's always a way to do it. All you have to do is be a little, uh, uh, use a little imagination with these kids. Okay. And, and put the parents in the cast, uh, or yeah. their put their mouth in a in a cast or something. Oh, a full full body head cast. Oh uh, yeah, uh, head and body cast. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, I think we're back to Jonah. Ask, in that last case, John, a 14-year-old? Yes. you see a little um, uh, subdeltoid bursitis there? Yes, I do. Okay. Probably a little bit of strain injury to the supraspinatus, but it's still intact. Okay, Jonah? All righty, so we've got a 20-year-old baseball pitcher with uh, shoulder pain. Um, so, okay, uh, looks like we've got maybe a little bit of irregularity of the uh, glenoid, actually. Yeah, so uh, what my experience is, is that in the mid-teens, 14 to 16, the injury you get is the growth plate here, and that's classic little league shoulder. When they get in the late teens, 18 to 20, the injuries that I see are impaction injuries of the glenoid, like we're seeing, uh -oh. which is less well-described and the literature, but we can see it. You picked up on it very nicely, Jonah. And it may be associated with the regularity of the articular cartilage, uh, but this is the kind of, uh, of uh, overuse injury that I typically see in the late teens. And then uh, when you get into uh, the, the college and professional players, we see more labral tears and the rotator cuff tears that we talked about earlier. So this is a, just call it a repetitive glenoid impaction injury, and uh, uh, that, that's a little bit later. Uh, but there are exceptions to every rule like this, and this is one of the exceptions. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? 
Uh, 13-year-old female baseball player, sharp pain throwing, a uh, real labral tear. Uh, it looks like a, you know, we have these uh, coronal, I'm sorry, uh, coronal images uh, after an orthogram and uh, what's it, PD and PD fat set. Uh, so it looks like, uh, I mean, right now I'm seeing some uh, marrow edema or increased signal in uh, uh, the metadiaphysis there. Uh, inferior to devices, but oh, okay, and there we go. A couple of arrows there. So now we're seeing some uh, apparently some cystic changes of the glenoid fossa, uh, and uh, it looks like also within the humeral head, uh, superior humeral head, uh, there's uh, injury, uh, possibly chondral injury to the humeral head as well. well this, Basically, is normal, it's a, this is a normal physis here. Oh, okay, thank you. And uh, uh, what uh, we're seeing is a subchondral impaction injury. Uh, Ilir. And here's what it looks like on the oblique uh, sagittal images. So this is a female baseball player, uh, and she was an underhand pitcher. Uh, so you can get this in both. She was a little bit younger than we typically see this, uh, but this was a repetitive trauma injury. Uh, so you can get it even with underhand throwing. But this is, this is that uh, uh, glenoid impaction injury. And overhead thrower men typically see it uh, closer to the end of the teen years. And the, but this is one case where we saw it in a younger teen who was a female underhand pitcher. Okay. We have a 12-year-old motocross accident patient. I have a, two actually chrono, I'm sorry, frontal radiographs of the um, shoulder and you could hallucinate if there's any little bit of uh, scler scler sclerosis of the superior glenoid um and um yeah and then there's also like a little widening of the lateral um metaphysis adjacent to the physio plate yeah so and then the it's just it's, so there was an accident so um, uh, if the patient had dislocated the shoulder um Or, or actually, okay, so the MRI, we have a chrono PD fat set and uh, looks like a T2 uh, image. Yeah, this, this, is, this is a stir. Stir, yeah. This is a month later. I mean, oh, it's a month later, later, yeah, okay. So it looks like we're on the, the, the current study, um, or like, you know, from one month before, there's like uh, edema along the uh, physio plate and also more metaphysis. Um, so, trabecular injury. Yeah, this is, so this is a, a, a Salter 1 oh, fracture. Oh, fracture, yeah. So this right. is what that looks like in an acute uh, trauma. Uh, so, Salter has two. Oh, because it was just, it exits, yeah. yeah. It's, it's almost a Salter 1. There's just a little bit of Salter 2 in with it. That's right. So you have a coronal T1 weighted image with uh, low T1 signal um, in the uh, greater tuberosity at the supraspinatus insertion. Uh, and then there's also this round low signal intensity in the glenoid. Okay. Uh, so this is just an avulsion fracture of the greater tuberosity. A skiing accident with my younger son. How do you know it's an avulsion versus a fracture? Uh, by just knowing the mechanism of the injury. Okay. John, what do you think of this case? All right. A nice normal variant here, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it looks like we've got an um, impaction fracture here with uh, so, the deformity of both the humeral head and the glenoid, um, some edema on the fluid sensitive uh, series. So you can, you can see the impaction of the glenoid and the fracture of the glenoid and then the impaction fracture of the humeral head. So th this person presented with limitation of range of motion. Big, big surprise, right? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? All right. <clears throat> so uh, we have these uh, axial 
uh, say T1 and uh, the PD fat side images of the shoulder, and uh, we see areas of uh, low signal, low T1 signal intensity in the uh, humeral head, with uh, uh, with the corresponding to areas of high signal intensity in PD fat side images. I think these are uh, subacute uh, fracture uh, of the humeral head. Why do you say um, subacute? Because of the increased signal intensity on the PD fat set, uh, if it were uh, acute, I wouldn't see as much signal. I mean, it'd be low, it'd be low signal. Uh, that's why I'm saying it's wait, subacute. Wait, wait. Wait, what would be low signal if it were acute? Yes. Well, what would be low signal? The fracture line on the, on the PD fat set. Why would it be low signal? Uh, the, I think it's the inflammation. Is, uh, I, uh, I think it's, well, that's, yeah, you don't really I think it's because inflammation, there's no inflammation as much as the, we were seeing a subacute uh, time, time frame. I don't think we're seeing inflammation here. What we're seeing really is a fracture of the trabecular bone and the subchondral bone here, a little bit of displacement, mm -hmm. and this is more hemorrhage uh, into the bone. Uh, with okay. And here we can see, and it's involving both the anatomic and the and the surgical necks here. So this is a comminuted fracture with some displacement and impaction here. And you can see it's with separation here of the subchondral bone of the articulating surface. Uh, and, and this was a four-part fracture. If you, it's, he's, you can determine the part fracture better by plain films because sometimes you get a lot of comminution in individual fractures, but we'll talk about the different fracture types in a minute. But this is an acute fracture. And then, uh, so a lot of people use near classification for fracture types uh, using uh, one part where, where there's still the bones intact, you just have kind of incomplete fractures, and then you two parts, three parts, and four parts, with obviously the more parts involved, the worse it is. John, do you want to comment about the fractures? Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I thought you were in pediatrics and you're going to go to a salter, but but I guess you went to near. Um, actually, a lot of times it's, you, you don't just have a four part, you have like a six or seven or eight part. Uh, they're, 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 it's just a, a crunch in a bag of bones. Anyway, the treatment um, is if, if, you, if you don't have a lot of osteoporosis, this usually occurs in um, old folks uh, and mostly women with uh, severe osteoporosis, and uh, fixing these is almost impossible. So uh, what you do is you put in a, a shoulder prosthesis and cement it in. Um, sometimes you have to do a total uh, shoulder replacement, but uh, you usually save that for another time. Uh, acutely, the best thing to do is just put in a prosthesis and, and get the patient moving. Yeah, that's if it's three or four part, right? Part. If it's a two-part, two uh, that's repairable with screws and wires, and uh, et cetera. And then three parts are also uh, doable. Uh, but here again, um, osteoporosis is, is a problem uh, because it may not hold wire and may not hold screws. Uh, and you wind up with a bag of bones when you operate. Um, and actually, sometimes when you make an incision, um, and the bones fall out. So you got to be very careful when you do the surgery in these people. Okay, thank you. Fortunately, it's not uh, terribly common, um, but it's common enough, um, especially people that uh, like to uh, be on bicycles and, and motorcycles. Yeah. Uh, but the older folks, of course, all it takes is a slip and fall, usually in a nursing home with slippery floors. Let's see. Okay, we got a chrono. Looks like a T1 on a PD fat sad image of the shoulder. Um, we have a looks like a comminuted fracture of the humeral head with at least one, two, or I mean, she's four part fracture. Yeah, well, at least three. At least three. Uh, if if the head is not, is not is a. Uh, You can't, uh, you can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well, John, but 
I want to talk over you. Anyway, um, you cannot really say it's a four-part fracture uh, or a three-part fracture unless you get uh, more um, more um, images. Okay, so uh, just a comminuted more, fracture. More fra yeah, all, all you can say is it's a comminuted fracture yeah. with what you have. Right. Yeah, if I remember right, that case it was a four-part fracture, but there were a lot of dis displaced bones, and the patient went on to a prosthesis. All right, looks like it would be, but again, let's see more, see more cuts. Uh, and I, here I am telling a radiologist that uh, I should be ashamed of myself. No. Eighty-six-year-old male status. Status was fall with fracture dislocation. Evaluate for the status of the tendons. Okay, so um, we have coronal T1 and T2 weighted images, and there's a, a large amount of uh, low signal intensity within the joint space, and the humeral head has uh, extensive irregular morphology. So there's at least one displaced fracture fragment superiorly, but we don't really see the rest of it um, very well. And then in the axillary pouch, um, there's a large fracture fragment inferiorly. Um, and then regarding the status of the tendons, they don't look very good. Uh, where's the humeral head? It's in the axillary pouch. There you go. Well, that's the main fragment. So what would you do with this? And then what we can see here, this is the supraspinatus tendon coming around and attaching to the greater tuberosity, which is up here. Uh, a lot of the rest of the humeral head is down in the axillary pouch. Here's uh, another image here uh, where we can see supraspinatus coming around, attaching to this bone fragment here. Here's the articulating surface of the humeral head uh, down in the axillary pouch. And uh, you, we don't have all the images here, but we can see a lot of the displacements. And it turned out that uh, when you look at everything, the tendons all really attach to the, the bone. This is the subscapularis coming around and, and attaching to the, uh, the humerus there. Uh, but uh, the major tendons of the, of the different uh, rotator cuff elements were each attaching to different bones that were all displaced in this setting. Uh, so we, we were able, John, we were able to tell him that the tendons were all attaching to the bones, uh, but the bones were not in their correct there there are too many bones and they're in the wrong position so uh what would you do with that information uh well when when you have uh, that many bones it's uh, it's, it's uh, a pretty uh, a pretty difficult procedure to, to to get everything back in place but i would expect that there would be an axillary nerve injury here um the other thing is uh, you, you, you don't, one thing you wouldn't want to do uh, or probably try to do is uh, try to pull on it to reduce it. I don't think that'd be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, needs an open reduction. And the whole, if you can put the bones and tack them back in place, what, what, uh, what's interesting about this is you see a pretty good cortex. So uh, this patient, I don't think, is osteoporotic for an 86-year-old, 84-year-old, is it? It's a pretty, pretty good, pretty good stock. Eighty-six-year-old male. Yeah. Uh, and so the, you might be able to salvage uh, this and not use a prosthesis, but uh, I would. Uh, yeah. Uh, otherwise, you just go ahead and put in a prosthesis, like I mentioned before, another case. Yeah. Great. Uh, here's another case that I want to point out. This is someone who has a fracture of the base of the coracoid, and you can see a little fracture fragment here. But you've got to be a little bit careful because there's a normal growth plate here that you don't want to call a fracture. Uh, in this case, this, this is a line that shouldn't be there. Uh, and occasionally, and this is actually a fracture that goes through the, uh, the, the, the growth plate. Uh, occasionally, you might have to check the other side if, you, if you're not sure uh, on this. But this turned out to be a, a comminuted fracture of the base of the coracoid process. And, and here's someone who has a chronic non-union of the humeral head. You can see the, the hypertrophic bone formation here, kind of attempted healing, but there's this chronic separation. And we can see the buttressing of the bone, uh, but there's too much motion here. 
uh, to allow healing, and we can see severe atrophy of the rest of the muscles, a lot of increased fat within the bone. So this is a patient who also has severe osteoporosis, and this was a uh, uh, chronic non-union uh, of the uh, proximal humerus. Uh, one of the problems with uh, uh, some people treating these is they put a weight on the forearm uh, or like a um, long uh, arm cast to give it some traction and that's the worst thing you can do for these. Uh, the best way to treat this is with a collar and cuff. In other words, uh, it's just like a sling but it's more comfortable. And um, and whatever you do is you don't let it hang too far. Well, what you see with these is uh, after somebody is in a sling uh, or a collar and cuff for a couple of days, the humerus looks like it's dislocated. Uh, the head of the humerus, you'll find it uh, below the uh, um, the glenoid. The glenoid, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I'm sure you've seen that uh, a thousand times with these cases, and you always worry that it's dislocated. Uh, I used to have fun with residents, uh, especially in the first year. They think, well, I found a dislocated shoulder, when of course it's just a rest that does it, the muscles relax and everything goes down. Uh, the problem here, I think, John, is this patient has an injury to the axillary nerve. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of atrophy of the muscles here, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Alrighty, so here's an 80-year-old female who's having a shoulder pain and limited range of motion for a month. Um, looks like she's got some labral and rotator cuff issues, but I think also there's something else going on. So kind of supramedially, we have a lot of signal abnormality and we have this, yeah, so this hypointense structure. Uh, looks like bone, so I, Scapula would live, okay, well, that makes it a lot easier now. So we, we have a fracture of the scapula. It's displaced. Um, there's some adjacent soft tissue edema. The bones themselves aren't that edematous. I mean, it could be subacute. Yeah. And, and this is another non-union. And you can see the ebernation of the bone on either side of the scapula. And I just want to point out how easy it is, if you don't, don't remember to look for it, to miss scapular fractures when you're doing an MR. A lot of these will be on the corner shots on the on the MR examination, uh, but just remember that. Okay, Jeff. All right. Uh, so this uh, coronal, uh, the T1 and T2 uh, images of the shoulder, uh, and I'm seeing it within the, uh, in the scapula. There's a lot of the signal intensity. Uh, there uh, in the, yeah in the, on the T2 images, so and there's the regularity of the uh, looks like the cortex. I'm suspicious that there is a, a fracture involving the uh, scapula or the scapular spine. Yeah, this uh, this is obviously displaced scapular fracture here, but again one that's easily missed because your tend to, your eye tends to go over here where we're used to seeing it. But uh, especially in the setting of trauma, you have to be very careful to look at the scapula. They call that the neck, don't they? Yes, the scapular neck. Thank you, John. And here's a, another comminuted fracture of the scapula, which we can see here. Uh, that's easy to miss if you don't look for it. Okay. And then, uh, let's see. 74-year-old male with pain after trauma. <clears throat> so we have uh, multiple coronal images demonstrating um, a lot of signal edema at the femoral kind of like metaphysis with a fracture line and tendinosis of the supraspinatus tendon. So worried about, again, trabecular injury with fracture. Also, there is this uh, low signal, actually like a low irregularity of the posterior glenoid anteriorly. I'm not sure if that there's a little fracture fragment or... Uh, so this was on 10 2010 and one year later. Three, year, three months later. Yeah, so it looks like those fractures are healed, but there is again significant amount of edema uh, along the lines of this fracture. So there's so worried about some traction, uh, repetitive injury from that um, supraspinatus tendon inserting to that 
uh, greater tuberosity and just causing a little traction and causing inflammation. Well, what do you think about the circulation and here? Circulation? Oh, so you were also about like avascular necrosis. Uh, if you hit um, the humeral head, like you know, circumferential, like uh, uh, artery. So double line sign, so AVN, post-traumatic. So one of the complications that we're all aware of when you have a fracture is that you may decrease vascularity to one of the fracture fragments. And that's what happened yeah. in this case. And yeah, that's not a surgical neck. That that injury is like a, almost like an anatomic neck. Yeah, down here. Plus, uh, plus the greater tuberosity. Yeah, right. You can actually yeah. see. This is actually a little displaced fragment here from yeah. the fraction. And uh, this is post-traumatic AVN. We're, we're getting healing. Uh, of the primary fracture, but we have osteonecrosis in one of the major fragments there. Okay, and here's. Um, the I'm sorry, John. Um, one thing about surgical neck fractures, uh, unless the doctor does something wrong, or the patient is a nervous wreck, uh, they almost always heal. It's pretty rare to find uh, a non-healing of the surgical neck fracture of the humerus. Uh, some, something has to be really drastically wrong in treatment or the patient is uh, really difficult to deal with uh, for them not to heal. Okay. So they almost never need surgery. Great. Uh, some people I've known as patients, what they try to do is they try to test the fracture and they try to feel the, the crunching and see if it's healed. They keep testing it, and that's how they get a non-union. Wow. That's one of the ways. I've had that happen uh, in a couple of patients, so I'm sure that's not terribly unusual. Okay. So here's a patient who had breast cancer and had a uh, osteoporotic fracture of the of the uh, of the surgical neck down here. And, but that's healed now, and now we can see that the patient's developed increasing pain uh, due to the AVN in, in the head, another post-traumatic AVN and with a kind of pretty characteristic double line sign. And then here's a more severe example of, of AVN involving the articulating surface, and this has an in-situ subchondral fragment, very large subchondral fragment, and a typical double line sign for AVN of the humeral head. And this was a professional diver uh, who came in uh, uh, with with the bins on multiple occasions. Uh, and this is uh, Caisson's disease. Uh, uh, multiple episodes of osteonecrosis due to, uh, uh, due to uh, gas inside the vascular system from, from uh, diving and uh, uh, not taking adequate precautions uh, when they come back to... Uh, to normal pressures. Okay, I see. 35 year old male with ulcerative colitis and shoulder pain. So you have coronal T1, I'm sorry, T2 and PD fat saturated images and there's uh, multiple serpiginous areas of irregularity within the humeral head, um, also consistent with avascular necrosis um, in this patient with UC. Uh, so what do you think caused it, uh, this shabby? The steroid therapy that they're on. Pardon me? It can be from the steroids uh, for uh, colitis patients. Yeah, the old treatment was steroids, but now I, I think that it was... Uh, uh, yeah, now... What the, what, what's the inhibitor that they use, John? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah now, now you really shouldn't use st steroids with this. It's, it should be treated very much similar to rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, ulcerative colitis, I believe, you know, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis actually were the first approved indications for the TNF-alpha inhibitors, the antibiotics uh, against uh, TNF uh, to treat it. But it's, it, now it's typically treated... Uh, like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and you really should go to the TNF alpha inhibitors fairly rapidly if you can't control it on uh, methotrexate. Okay. 
I have a friend that has a, a mo, mo, most um, uh, folks that uh, get Crohn's disease, uh, believe it or not, are um, Irish. And, uh, kind of interesting. Yeah. Small island, and uh, that, that's what they, they have. Is um, I guess that's because of the close relationships between different tribes or whatever uh, from the old days. And uh, that's the most common uh, uh, country that, that, that has Crohn, uh, uh, Crohn's yeah. disease. Yeah. And I found that out recently, actually, which is kind of interesting. Interesting, right? I, I never knew that, but interesting. here we go. Okay. Uh, this is thought to be due to uh, kind of a vasculitis and inflammatory condition, but I certainly think the steroids could, could have worsened it. Okay. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this? All right. So, uh, shoulder pain, roll out mass. Um, we've got a uh, radiograph of this patient's uh, shoulder. Um, well, I'm not seeing much. I'm seeing some maybe AC joint arthrosis, a little bit of downward sloping. Um, okay, let's see here. Now, maybe some soft tissue fullness, uh, kind of here of the humeral head. Yeah, some irregularity there, some patchy calcification. Um, okay, I think they've at least done cross-sectional imaging. Oh, hmm. okay. So we see a lot of uh, bone marrow edema. If I can see that again. Yep. And it seems as though there's a discontinuity here as well. Um, this doesn't look like a mass so much as, or like, oh, yeah, okay. And then on, on this image, it looks like we've actually uh, evulsed yeah, this is a little bit later still. So if we go back, wait. Yeah. So this is eight uh, eighteen oh five. It really looks pretty normal here. This normal lucency in the and the radial head. Uh, a couple of months, a month and a half later, we're starting to get some uh, a calcification in this particular area that wasn't there before. Uh, but at this time, you really don't see any avulsed. Uh, bone fragments. On the MR, however, you can, uh, at that, that particular time, you can actually see that this is very abnormal. See a lot of edema. We can see an avulsed fragment here that's in situ that looks a little bit comminuted. And then uh, a little bit later, we can we actually see a little uh, cortical fragment that's been pulled off here. And this is all an avulsion injury uh, in someone who was has uh, osteoporosis. Uh, yes, John? Was this a litigation case? I don't remember. Yeah, of course, uh, all you have to do is treat this patient with collar and cuff, and this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Okay, so that's just some, some bone injuries. Uh, why don't we go in and talk a little bit about the acromioclavicular joint now. And the uh, classic uh, description of injuries to the acromioclavicular joint really are in the Rockwood classification. And, uh, and normally you have intact uh, chromioclavicular and corcoclavicular ligaments. At uh, type 1, you get a sprain of the AC ligaments, but the CC ligaments are intact. Type 2, we have a rupture of the AC ligaments, a sprain of the CC. Type 3, you have ruptures of both of those. Type 4, you have a type 3 with ruptures of both, but you have a posterior dislocation of the clavicle. Type 5 is a type 3 but with a, a large degree of separation. And then a type 6 is an inferior clavicular dislocation. Uh, this is being quite rare. So uh, here's just a schematic diagram uh, showing the, uh, chromio, uh, the uh, chromioclavicular, the, uh, the AC joint is up here, and the chromioclavicular ligaments are up in this area. Uh, then we have the uh, corcochromial ligaments here, the trapezoid and the colloid uh, components. So uh, what are we looking at now? I, I find it best to evaluate the CC ligaments in the sagittal plane, but I also always evaluate them in the coronal plane as well. Both can be very useful, as we'll, we'll see in a minute. So you should make sure whenever you do MR imaging on the shoulder that the medial-most sagittal image uh, includes uh, the medial most section of the CC ligament so that you can evaluate the CC ligament. And here we can see a nice intact CC ligament here with nice sharp margins uh, uh, between the two. Uh, 
Now, here's a patient uh, who came in with uh, pain in this area. We can see edema surrounding the distal end of the uh, clavicle. Uh, and, but, and this patient had that intact CC ligament. Uh, so this would be a type 1 injury where you have a sprain of the uh, AC ligaments, uh, uh, chromoclavicular ligaments, uh, and uh, the CC ligaments are intact. So that's what a type 1 injury looks like. Uh, let's see. Jeff, what do you think of this case? All right. <clears throat> so his uh, coronal kidney fat side image of the uh, shoulder demonstrating uh, the uh, AC joint. Uh, what we see is a significant, there is a, a fluid within the joint. Uh, the, uh, there, there is also some, you know, some sclerosis. Uh, of the joint. I'd maybe go measurement of the joint space if we're concerned about a trauma, uh, you know, evaluate for, you know, yeah. a, a normal distance. Uh, oh, but at this point, what, what's uh, the normal distance if you measure? Uh, I think it's like somewhere between five to eight millimeters yeah. along those lines. That's right. Certainly one yeah. centimeter is, yeah. is abnormal. And here, but we can also see fluid tracking through the superior uh, portion of the capsule uh, along the, uh, the deltoid muscle here, and that's abnormal. Uh, so, so in the acute setting, uh, this would be at least uh, a grade one. Uh, you can also get changes without recent acute trauma, and this could be uh, more uh, chronic. But in the setting of acute trauma, uh, this, this would be at least a grade one. That would be an injury. And here we can actually see damage to the distal clavicle and uh, hemorrhage extending or fluid extending out into the anterior soft tissues. Here we can see that injury. And uh, this, these are the sagittal images. Uh, what do you think about those? Uh, so in the sagittal images, uh, we're looking at the uh, chloroquinoclear ligament, and it appears to be lax, uh, as well as, uh, at least on the second one on the right, uh, it's possible, it's like a probable uh, partial avulsion uh, at, uh, at the coracoid process. Uh, yeah, I... I guess you can get avulsions, but avulsions are pretty uncommon here in my experience. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is that sometimes these ligaments are oblique to the plane that we're imaging in. And here we can see that its attachment to the distal clavicle looks nice on this image, and its attachment to the coracoid process looks fine here. And this was in, and, and the margins are nice and sharp. If you have an acute tear, you don't have nice sharp margins like this. So this was an intact CC ligament in this patient, uh, um, gro grossly intact. We can see a little bit of edema in the area. This is the coronal image uh, showing the, uh, and this was a type 1 injury uh, from football playing. Okay. Uh, got an Ironman athlete with pain. Uh, we got two sagittal PD fat sat images of the shoulder. Again, we see a lot of edema at the AC joint um, on both sides. Uh, and then also the CC interval, uh, there's not much edema, but I don't see it. Yeah. So again, you're worried about at least a type 1 AC injury given a patient's like mechanism of injury. Yeah, so, but, but this actually, this patient did not have an acute injury, so actually, this was someone who, uh, an Ironman athlete who has chronic pain, and what we see is edema on both sides, primarily involving the bone, maybe some hypertrophic change, uh, uh, but uh, we, we did a study that we published in Skeletal Radiology back in 2008, where we imaged uh, Ironman uh, triathletes uh, uh, at the... Uh, end of uh, the uh, Hawaii uh, Ironman event. And then we also did imaging. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, MR scans from individuals from our centers here in Southern California who we did shoulder pain on but who did not have tenderness or pain in the region of the AC leg of, of the, of the uh, uh, chromoclavicular joint. And so what we found is that edema on the fat-suppressed images on either side of the AC joint is very common in both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. So uh, edema is usually a good sign of, of uh, pain in a lot of individuals, 
Uh, and also, we in the Ironman athletes we did, we divided them into symptomatic and asymptomatic Ironman concerning the, the, the AC joint. And again, we didn't really find edema to be a good differentiator. A lot of people have edema around the AC joint, even who don't seem to have symptoms associated with the AC joint. So I just want to point out that this is a very common location for chronic disease. In fact, almost all the shoulders that we image in patients over the age of 40 will have a non, not a normal AC joint. And actually, if you actually go in, uh, in teenagers, you typically have an intact disc in the AC joint. And by the age of 40, that disc is almost always degenerated in uh, pathologic studies. Uh, so uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that virtually everyone from 40 years on have degenerative disease of the AC joint. Fortunately, the vast majority of those people don't have symptoms, and edema alone doesn't seem to be a good differentiator between those who have symptoms and those who don't. I still describe it in my report, uh, but I usually don't put edema alone as an impression, since it doesn't seem to correlate well with symptoms. John, do you have a comment? Um, I, I think these people, the uh, Ironman people, uh, are... are um, uh, having too many endorphins released in their system with, with what they do. Uh, you, you've got to be really uh, a masochist uh, to go through that uh, stuff. Uh, I guess they get such joy out of getting endorphins, and that's why they do it. And that's probably why they don't feel pain. I look at this, and I feel pain. <laughs> Just, uh... Right. You're versing together. Okay. Uh... So who did the last one? I'm sorry. Okay. It's a 36-year-old weightlifter with shoulder pain. You have uh, coronal T1 fat saturated images. A uh, patient who's had an arthrogram, and in the uh, at the level of the AC joint, there's uh, irregularity on both sides of the joint space, um, and edema with distension of the capsule. Um, so with a weightlifter, uh, I don't see anything. Or there's no contrast. It's going through a, a cuff tear. They're going through the AC joint. Um, there's also not fluid signal going beyond the level of the capsule. Um, so chronic, yeah. And, and this is called this is called osteolysis, but it's really a chronic repetitive traumatic injury to the articulating surfaces of the bone, and you can get separation. Uh, uh, uh. An x-ray probably would be helpful. Yeah, an x-ray would, would uh, also show uh, separation. Now, uh, if it's an athlete that just has one, uses one shoulder uh, and not both, then you can see a asymmetry. I think we saw that on an x-ray earlier. Uh, weightlifters like this, typically it's, it's symmetric, and you get the indistinctness of the ends of the bone and some separation, uh, but, but no displacement. So, but this my impression. I frequently x-rayed both sides when it came to the AC joint. Yeah, that's a good, I think that's a good idea. Uh, but this, again, is a chronic lesion. It doesn't really fit into the classification system, the Rockwood classification system, was, which was really for acute trauma. Yeah, that's a different situation. Yeah, so, but I just want to point this out because you'll see this all the time. And, and again, uh, a lot of this may be symptomatic, and there have been surgeries in the past where you do Mumford procedures, uh, to correct for this, but but I think that procedure is done less commonly now than I, than I think it was done 10 or 15 years ago. What do you think, John? I I wouldn't do it. Uh, just rest the shoulder, and and uh, the chances are it'll just take care of itself. And anti-inflammatory meds. Okay. So why don't we stop here, and we'll pick up here uh, tomorrow. Any questions?